The Heart of History by John Weir Perry World Images in Turmoil and Transition From many observations, a few of which have been elaborated in the foregoing accounts, it has become evident to me that visions of the end of the world and of its new beginning take an impressively central place in the major turning points and development of both persons and of cultures. They may be said to concern the destruction and recreation of the psyche's world image in the turmoils of drastic change. Even though one may now live in an age of reason, science, and technology, and find the mentality of myth and vision a little distant, still when one finds oneself at the crossroads in matters of psychological development, the dreams that become constellated reveal a lively myth-making process. If an individual is fragile in makeup because of certain emotional circumstances, these archaic contents may become so activated as to overwhelm the field of awareness, resulting in what is commonly regarded as a psychotic episode. This is a state, as Jung has succinctly put it, in which the dream takes the place of reality. An acute condition of this kind stirs up the deeper levels of the psyche in such a way as to provide an open window into the processes that transform its energies and motivations. On this account, I have found the investigation of psychotic ideation to be a fruitful avenue toward gaining an understanding of the myth-making process. We can also see it in a picture of the intense struggle of persons to find their way into social maturation trust and relationships. After the preceding review of a variety of messianic movements, can it any longer sound unfamiliar to us when we hear persons who, in their visionary states of this overwhelming kind, have felt that they have a calling to be a savior of the nations against an enemy, that the world is in the balance between total annihilation and rescue, that major world powers are meeting in a final Armageddon at the world center, that they feel themselves to have died and are to be dwelling among the living dead that they are beholding the creation of a new heaven and a new earth, that they envision their mission to bring about a new age in the heavenly city, or that they feel themselves being enthroned as king or queen of a new world. Prophetic Visions and Their Psychotic Counterparts I have been impressed, therefore, with the similarities in the renewal process shown in the visionary experience of prophets and of psychotic states. Culture change under acute stress is the concern of each, one serving the society, the other serving the personal emotional life. Yet there are, of course, important differences. It is my opinion that the psychic process is the same in each, but the qualities of personalities th through which the process is mediated are at variance. Prophets are talented, articulate, and charismatic. Individuals, while psychotic, become shattered by their visions. Their myths are as fragmented as they are, and they find it hard to express their myths clearly or with the ardor of feeling. Our cultural assumptions determine our habits of thought in regard to psychosis, our traditions have undervalued the inner life in favor of the external, the objective, and the action-oriented effectiveness in relating to the outer world. However, a new cultural proclivity is setting in that holds the opposite view, an esteem for the inner, the personal, and the harmonious relation to our own center. Our need, obviously, is for a psychological model that can take account of all the various dimensions of the psyche. It needs to indicate how the psyche goes about affecting its own growth through its own non-rational processes and the stressful turmoils that they involve. The item of first importance in this model is that it should take account of the ordering, organizing, and integrating processes percolating upwards from the unconscious towards the ego. This viewpoint would counter the prevailing assumption that order in the psyche is handled by the ego and imposed from above downwards. A corollary of this point would be that transformation is not affected only by the insights and consequent controls that the ego might gain, but that it takes place in symbolic modes below the surface, preparing the ego for new ways of emotional expression and living. An account of a renewal process. For an understanding of psychotic process in such a growth model, the chief difficulty is to discern how it is that new ingredients of development evolve from the representation in symbolic imagery in the lower inner levels into their full expression in emotional living in the upper outer levels of the psyche. To provide the experiential field to this train of events, I will give a brief account of an illustrative case. Francesca was admitted in mid-December into a residence facility where the policy was to allow the psychosis to run its course without medication. She was a young Catholic woman in her late 20s who had been married seven years and had two young children. The occasion for her break was that she had fallen in love with Paolo, a friend of hers and her husband's. The day after revealing this to her spouse, she became psychotic. 
Also, in the recent weeks before, she had become involved with a woman friend in what she called devil worship, implying black magic and witchcraft. There was a clear repetition of family history in her romance. When her father had returned home from World War II, unable to provide for her mother with love, the mother had responded to this frustration by carrying on an extramarital affair and later became alcoholic, for which she, too, had to be hospitalized on several occasions. She had worked in a restaurant where she had met the man she married after divorcing her husband. Francesca became closely involved with Paolo in a similar circumstance of a tryst in a restaurant when she, like her mother, found her husband to be cool and passive. The recent death of her stepfather, of whom she was fond, left her feeling somehow guilty, redoubling the guilt that she felt toward her children over the amorous involvement. On admission to the residence, Francesca was concerned about dying. She felt pain and pulling sensations in her chest and arm. These seemed to her to represent her being drawn into four directions, as if on the arms of a cross. This crucifixion is a kind of crossing over, she said in a punning wordplay. The illusion was that the facility's name diabasis, the Greek word for a crossing over. She was given expression to her guilt and remorse by pounding her chest in a me culpa manner. I'm carrying my mother's burden, was her statement. She wanted to be held and stroked and to become a little girl again. What a trip, she declared. I'm a little girl again. Adam and Eve were my parents. During these first days, she craved much holding and cuddling. On the third day, she explained, My body hurts. It feels empty and I need love. I'm filled with memories of my father and mother. It was on the occasion of this statement that she narrated the story of her mother's rejection, affair, and subsequent alcoholism and hospitalization, and of her own guilt toward her children. The next day, she was full of good humor and laughter that the staff found both mirthful and contagious. She was full of talk and affectionate expressions toward various members of the staff, drawing close and hugging. In fact, she strongly identified with the love goddess. She spoke of fears of death and of some general cataclysm which would amount to a rebirth of society. She was sure she had to die and be reborn. Her god, she said, was a plant that had withered but then grew new foliage. Her withdrawal began to lift during these days, and by the ninth day she was indeed experiencing the feeling of being reborn, and was delighted with her new state of being. There's a new me, she declared. I have new reborn feelings. And these she perceived as new little green shoots of the plant. After the first week, most of her talk was quite coherent and her mood usually elevated. Her principal emphasis was on getting affection from people and having an open reception from them, particularly the male members of the staff. In all this, there was a good deal of showy, phony expression of feeling and seductiveness that became somewhat aggravating to the staff. In the third week, she expressed some feelings of being called to a special mission, to make things all right for Jesus to be here on earth, and she felt some identification with one of the great women mystics and with Joan of Arc. At the end of the fourth week, she felt, God's within me. I feel the goodness of knowing this. I was the devil before. She also had a sense of the king and the queen within me. After the fourth week, she remained clear of her psychotic condition, and she was ready for her discharge at the end of the eighth week. The account of Francesca exemplifies the principle of the transformative process in the psychotic experience, that when a new component of development is becoming activated and taking shape in the depths of the unconscious, it first appears in the form of a symbolic image of mythic caste. As she found her marriage becoming unfulfilling, Francesca naturally felt prompted to complement the relationship with another that promised to contain all the elements left out. The missing elements were encountered in projection outside, seemingly embodied in another man. With remarkable faithfulness to its meaning, she accounted for this liaison as an effort to reach her husband through the other man. The fault was only that the needed lovingness was appearing not within herself, but was instead projected out in the form of Paolo. The guilt, one might say, came not only from the moral prohibition of infidelity, but also from the intuition that this was not getting to the issue. One is reminded of the Greek expression for sin in a word that connotes missing the mark. There was no way ahead for her in this direction. Her recoil and guilt threw her into a profound regression and activation of the archetypal unconscious. As soon as this set in, an array of powerful images impressed themselves upon her that belonged to the typical sequence that I have come to call the renewal process. The intent of it is to reorganize the self and in it the basic motivations that emanate from the center, the core of the personality, are transformed. The elements of this process that are typical of most cases are present in her account. She found herself at the world center at the time of creation in Eden. 
as daughter of the primordial parents. She also was thrown back to the feeling of the beginning of her life as a little girl again and wanted to be cuddled as a babe in arms. This return was accompanied by the experience of death by crucifixion, burial, and descent to hell or purgatory, and of possession by the devil. A conflict of opposing cosmic forces was seen as a war, possibly a war of the worlds, together with the sense of an impending upheaval of the world in an earthquake. She feared being turned into a man, which made her angry. She was finding herself exalted to the status of the goddess of love and of a new Joan of Arc, or sainted mystic. She beheld the image of the royal couple, king and queen, in herself. The death and descent led over into the experience of rebirth and starting life anew, with new reborn feelings. Great things were happening for the world in the form of the coming of the Lord, which would by implication promise a new era, possibly the messianic one. Judging by the choice of phrase from the prophetic scriptures, she felt herself specially chosen to prepare the way and make the world right for the Messiah to come. Now, if all she needed at the beginning of the process was to learn to love more caringly and with more warmth, then why all the elaborate myth formation? At first glance, perhaps, most of it would not seem to have much to do with the question of loving. Various schools of thought have different recommendations to make regarding the symbolic ideation. It should not be allowed to go on, or it may continue, but one should not give special attention to it. Or, if her inner journey takes this form, she should be allowed to make it what she will without interference from therapists. The policy of our facility was to relate to it with interest and caring, and to try to make sense of it with her and not suppress it by medication. The historical evidence gives to the sequence of mythic imagery meaning in that the imagery follows the main lines of the great myth and ritual forms of antiquity. The New Year festivals of renewal of king and kingdom that I have described extensively elsewhere. The close parallels found in these ceremonials are what have led me to call this style of psychotic episode the renewal process. The only satisfying conclusion that can be drawn is that when the psyche is in need of reorganization, there are its habitual ways of affecting it. They are its innate modes of instigating change. If it does not make sense to us and appears bizarre, that is not the fault of the psyche or of nature, but our own for not being able or willing to understand it. To put it another way, when the values that one is to live by are in need of change, they cannot be altered fundamentally just by right thinking or right feeling. They undergo transformation in the foundations of the mental life. Fundamental change is affected in the fundaments of the psyche. In these terms, this young lady went through something like this. Her psychic center was activated and she died to her previous mode of existence and regressed back to childhood, there to begin over again to form and experience a new structure of values and meanings. Her values clashed in an array of opposites to form a new world image. Among the opposites, she became acquainted with the contrasexual component. Meanwhile, she identified with the archetype of woman, the female deity, but significantly in her aspect of a love goddess. The goddess image, one might say, was the wellspring of her innate potential for lovingness, the personification of the Eros principle that had remained somewhat dormant in her through the years of her growth. The semi-divine couple, king and queen, were likewise personifications of her potential for the man-woman relationship. With her own new beginning in the image of rebirth, she was aware of many new feelings being generated. Along with this, she was filled with the atmosphere of a new age personified in the coming of the Messiah, that is, her own new social and cultural set with which she would be re-entering the world with her new start in life. When put this way, can it really be said that this imagery is of little value? It would be if all the symbolic images were merely wish fulfillments of ego ideals. This is where the psychological model by which we gauge the meaning of these processes come into play to determine our conclusions. If we say that it is not wishes but potentials that are locked in these symbolic expressions, then we regard them in an altogether different manner. The difficulty in psychosis, again, is that of actually affecting the transformation of new ingredients of development. They first arise in mythic expression, in the state of potential. They then evolve into a full conscious capacity to bring them into play, in emotional living. Francesca's capacity for relationship began to appear to her identification with the love goddess archetype and her perception of the king and queen images in her. The more conscious state of this capacity was registered in her rejoicing over her newborn or reborn feelings, although these needed much more conscientious effort and therapy to adapt them to an actual relationship. Certain confrontations by her therapist did in fact assist her in becoming aware of her actual feelings out of their background in the more diffuse waves 
of archetypal love. That is, the all-embracing love emanating from the mythic images of the goddess. The statements of her experience of new birth are accurate renderings of the meaning of her psychotic journey. The import of the entire progress through death, regression, and new birth customarily appears to be, as I have pointed out, the transformation of the self and the reorganization of the personality. In the images of the goddess, god and devil, and king and queen, it is the central archetype that is the dynamic focus of the process, and its work usually seems to engender a new capacity for relationship as the Eros principle becomes activated. To sum up and epitomize the nature of the transformation in the psychotic process, the basic principle on which it is founded is that all components of development come to their fullness in the personality by a gradual differentiation from the inchoate state in the archetypal unconscious, where they are first represented in effect images. When certain components are needed for further growth of the personality and have not been playing their part in it before, they become activated in these deepest levels of the psyche. If such a change requires a basically new orientation, a visionary state is induced and the renewal process is set in motion. When the new component makes its appearance in an affect image, it is at this stage a mere potential awaiting actualization in emotional living, thereafter a gradual process of differentiation through experience, trial and error, and modification must be undergone. World Images in Turmoil I have selected this case as an illustration of the role of the messianic calling and breakup of the world image during the psychotic visionary experience that transforms the self and activates the Eros principle. I will now attempt to present a glimpse of the morphology of the world image as it makes its appearance in two areas of experience, the personal and the cultural, indicating the close similarity of the symbolic theme in individual and in collective experience. Persons in a deeply psychotic state tend to visualize the world in the form of a quadrate circle, or mandala. I first began to realize this during the initial psychotherapeutic interviews with a young woman patient. She mentioned that she was at the middle of the world between opposing factions. When I provided drawing materials with color, she elaborated her visualization of the experience. As figure one shows, her divided self is at the center and the stages of her disturbance are in the concentric circles around it, moving outward with time. Six petals indicated her mixed up ideas, giving the design a lotus-like enclosure. Surrounding all, she drew a band divided in a red and blue segment. These represented the mothers and the fathers halves of the world divided in the opposition of their political parties, one conservative, the other liberal. The whole was enclosed in a square with four gates, not all completed in the drawing but mentioned verbally. The entire design had the meaning of her inner experience, of the hospital and the grounds, and of the world in its entirety all compounded together in a single diagram. Her second drawing, shown in figure 2, concerned her experience of the rivalry of friendships in her adolescence. The fronds were drawn as she told the story, but without hesitation the conflict was put into a cosmic context. The triangle-shaped blossom was the sun, the crescent of the root of the planet was the moon, and the surrounding circle the world. She then explained that some people think of the world as a square as well as round, so she added the four corners as designating the afterlife in its opposing aspects and colors. During the ensuing weeks, the number of political parties wanting to dominate the world grew to four, each with its particular ideology and value system. The final drawing, at the end of a process of several drawings and six weeks duration, can be seen in figure three. To be a clearly quadrated world, the story it depicts was that the four parties located in the four directions with their continents, at first clashed in a violent Armageddon, so that all was dark and stormy. But they then reconciled, and with the new peace, the sun shone brightly at the center, and all factions learned to live sensibly together in harmony. Another person in a deep and profoundly disturbed psychotic state similarly expressed his experience in cosmic imagery. He felt himself going through the death and rebirth of an initiation process, figure four. It began with a Dante-esque descent into hell as a triangle with a central point, and through purgatory as a square enclosing the triangle with a central point, and then an ascent to heaven as a pentagon still enclosing the triangle, now the central point was God, with whom he identified. This last image was a space-time diagram inasmuch as it enclosed the final stage in a circle marked as a clock, counting the quarters as 3, 6, 9, and 12. The central point subsequently turned out to be an important element being an axis that could convey him up and down between the head and the heart. A somewhat similar image followed in figure 5, in which he humorously represented his purgatorial regression in delightful space-time diagram called 
back clock, counting the hours backwards, this time 12, 9, 6, and 3, with the sun at the center of the quadrants, presiding over the whole. Societal concerns followed in which his inflation prompted him to believe that he was the new messiah on behalf of the world mission to establish a new ideal society of a united world of Our Lady Fatima. He depicted this world, figure six, and the rosary of this sodality in four quadrants, each representing one of the four continents, the Pacific countries, Europe, Africa, and North America, each with its own color. Finally, in figure seven, we find a remarkable example of the power of an altered state of consciousness to transform the world image into its archaic form. Even though he was an aviation navigator, expert in the exactitudes of the most modern cartography, in this visionary state, he beheld the world as a sort of icon, consisting of four petals surrounding a central body, representing North and South America, the Atlantic and the Pacific, around and enlarged in Central America. The idea of four continents still prevails by its placing Europe and Asia at the right and left apices of an ovoid world. The theme of four continents of quadrated world again appears in figure eight, the drawing of another young man in a deeply disturbed psychotic state. It shows a round world enclosed in a spiral consisting of four continents, this time the four British Isles, each in its own color. The sun here is off to one side. It had for him the meaning of the ideal way of life for him and his wife, whose Latin background and style of family clan living upset him. In similar vein, a young Latin American woman not inclined to draw her imagery gave clear verbal accounts of her vision of an Aztec world over which she believed her grandfather to preside as an autocratic emperor. She herself was queen. His four sons overthrew him and divided the Aztec world into quadrants to be governed by an ideal egalitarian regime. These world images, I should emphasize, were created purely spontaneously and unbidden in interviews with me, drawn always during a line of lively chatter which articulated the flow of thought that went into them. Again and again, the visionary mind's world is seen as round, either quadrated or squared, with a strong emphasis on what is at the center and with the differentiation of four continents, races, colors, creeds, or political ideologies, each at the cardinal point of the compass. World Images and Cultural Form The visionary mind that appears in these altered states is archaic and ancient, but not primitive. It still carries the motifs of the age of great myth-making that I have called the archaic Arab incarnated myth, namely the time of the highly energetic burgeoning of the mythic forms of the patriarchy in the urban revolution. At that time, the Sacro Kings were customarily viewed as the embodiment of the people and as the living center of the realm. The kingdom itself was conceived in the image of the world or the cosmos and often built to show it in its quadrated, circular, or squared form. Several examples of the iconography of these ancient cultures are represented here to give a glimpse of the world image as they visualized it. Figure 9 shows a late Babylonian diagram of the world. The stone is chipped, making it a little difficult to discern that the ring of the perimeter is marked by a triangular point in four directions. In figure 10, the Iranian citadel of Gur near Firuzabad is constructed in concentric circles of ramparts and in avenues stretching out from the center in the cardinal directions, thus representing the mesocosm in the likeness of the macrocosm. The Han mirror in figure 11 portrays the Chinese world. The square is Chongkyo. Middle Kingdom, with the Son of Heaven at the center. Four limbs of a cross stand for the four seas, the barbarian lands awaiting assimilation into the ordered world of the Empire. The Dome of Heaven encloses the whole. A space-time diagram is found in the Mexican Aztec calendar stone, figure 12, in which the rectangular plaques in the four directions represent the four great world ages, the central idea being the fifth and final one presided over by the Sun. Two great serpents enclose the world reminiscent of the theme in figure one of the mother and father's halves of the world. Other indications of the world pattern can be found in a variety of cultures, the Etruscan division into quadrants, each with its own color and characteristic metal stood at the same time, like the Mexican for the four great world ages. Peru's capital city, Cusco, was shaped into quadrants standing for the four segments of the empire in the four directions. Comparably, the Egyptian hieroglyph for the word world was a circle divided into quadrants by a cross, and in Ireland, the city of the great king of kings at Tara was at the center of the realm, flanked by four kingdoms. Cultural Ideologies and World Images While the iconography of the world image is exciting to observe, so neatly following out the design of the archaic mythic cosmos, 
more significant still is the meaning attached to these symbolic forms. All these images of world or cosmos are expressions of certain kinds of cultural order and ideology. The visualizations of the world image of these individuals with whom I worked likewise were expressions of order and ideology. As noted earlier, these people explained the meanings of the visualizations as they drew or verbalized them. Each was sensing momentous events underway to affect reforms of the world society and to produce a redeemed state and a way of life through political or religious programs. Each saw him or herself in a key messianic role. In every case, these changes were to be brought about by cataclysmic clashes between opposing powers standing for socio-cultural or spiritual ideologies. The question raised by these observations is, then, how is it that profound cultural renewals come to be represented in terms of the quadrated world image? What is it about the affect image that is so powerfully dynamic in the process of change and transformation? To begin with, it is evident that the world renewal that once took place on the collective level in the great ceremonial festivals of the sacral kingships has shifted over the centuries from its externalized form in myth and ritual traditions to its internalized counterpart in the spontaneous myth-making process of individuals. In the turbulent, disrupted, visionary states of psychosis, however, the world renewal is still perceived as an external issue involving nations and religions. It is apparent to everyone except the person undergoing it that it is all taking place in the subjective arena. Indeed, what seems so public to the individual in this state is in fact among the most private and isolated experiences possible for humans to undergo. Yet the painful paradox remains that the issues these persons are grappling with are at the same time those that are troubling the collective society. Can it be that the problems and the resolutions in these visionary states represent in symbolic form those that the society also experiences? What takes place in the quadrated world image, the mandala, has to do with transformation and integrative psychic processes within the individual, as Jung observed more than 50 years ago in his formulation of the individuation process. Dreams and other visualizations of the affect images tend to represent a psychic center that is superordinate to the ego and that takes the form of the quadrated circle, the mandala. When the self is engaged in the tremendously powerful process of reorganization, the phases of the changes are apparently governed by this dynamic center. It has its own way of bringing about the needed steps in growth and development that seem strange and unfamiliar to our rational consciousness, mostly for reasons of cultural bias, one that has pushed them back into unconsciousness through centuries of historical conditioning. The Images of Self and World Seen from this perspective, the world image represents both a selfhood and an internal culture. The issues appearing in the development of personality are at the same time the issues of cultural evolution. Selfhood, after all, manifests itself through a way of life, a way of being in the world, arising out of the world view. This way amounts to a structure of meaning, a belief system, and also a value system. The image of self and of world is thus a kind of epitome and a symbol of that which will differentiate out and elaborate itself into all manner of specific concepts and feelings. One might compare this to the tiny acorn that contains, coded into it, all that is to become the gigantic oak. The life progress of a symbolic form is thus to be seen as an instance of nature's miraculous metamorphosis. Is it any more astounding to think of an entire subjective culture arising out of an affect image than to conceive an entire human organism differentiating out of a microscopic sperm and ovum. In this framework of organization of the psyche, when profound and acute reorganization of either the self or of the culture is required, the factors brought into play are the same in both. Sensitive persons who have the aptitude for visionary encounters with the archaic affect images experience an activation of the world image. The opposites are rent asunder, that is, opposing forces clash, and disorder vies with order. The previous predominating pattern is broken up, or at least such a catastrophe is threatened. There follows its transformation in the image of world regeneration as the seed of a new culture form in mythic expression. This suggests that a transformed culture arises out of transformed persons. Summary To sum it up then, how the world image came to be what it is and to do what it does, evidence indicates that the mandala assumed its full form first as an image of the cosmos. This occurred at a juncture in cultural evolution when the mythic cosmos axis was projected not into the persons of sacral kings and when the shape of the cosmos was concretized in the structure of the hieratic city kingdoms. 
at a slightly layered turning point that took place. Through the work of visionary prophets and philosophers, the internalization of these images with the democratization of the kingly forms. Cosmic images then were recognized as expressions of an inner spiritual center and inner world. With this turn came an awareness of the selfhood of the individual as a wholeness to be realized by spiritual cultivation, expressed in the world image, centered and quadrated. Thus, the image embodies the affinity of the inner and outer worlds or cultures. Each is an expression of the other processes. The emotional aspect of the image occurs in the form of a peak experience, in which one feels intensely a oneness with all people and things in the world or cosmos. This emotion, needless to say, tends to be felt as an all-pervasive love for all beings. Great cultural transitions of earlier centuries have brought these discoveries to the fore in the world's consciousness.